evening, uh, we, we have an interesting uh, passage that we're going to look at, um, uh, really just to sort of kick things off, but uh, what I want to do is read this account in the book of Exodus. It's in Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 through 35, and what we're going to do is, is relate this, at least to the first part of what we're going to look at this evening, which is how prayer changes us. Now, it, it may seem initially like this is kind of a leap to go from what Moses experienced to what we experience, but as a matter of fact, Paul applies it in essentially this very way in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So let's begin by uh, looking at Exodus 34, uh, verses 29 through 35. This is what we read. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai... And the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him, that is, with God. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take, the veil, or take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Uh, again, time with the Lord uh, brings about a certain kind of transformation. We'll just sort of say that right here, and uh, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit more carefully uh, in, in the sermon. Now, this morning we saw that uh, prayer is more than simply asking the Lord for things, it is, first, I think, and foremost of all, fellowship with the Lord. Uh, it's taking time to develop our relationship with Him. And we saw that we, we do that in, in various ways, uh, by expressing our love to Him, uh, how much we uh, love Him and why it is that we love Him. Remember, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Spirit of God writes that law upon our hearts, gives us that ability and that desire, it's going to come out in our time of prayer. We should express it freely. We should also express our thankfulness for what the Lord has done. He saved us and what He continues to do for us. He provides for us and sustains us and, you know, gives us everything we need uh, to, to do what He calls us to do, not to mention all the promises that He's made. We should confess our sins to the Lord for how we have behaved in the light of all the love He has shown us, remembering that when we confess our sins, the Lord will forgive us of all of our sins. And then we should ask for what we want. But remember, Jesus told us this morning that when we ask, we do need to ask in His name. And we saw that means really a couple of things. We, first of all, need to ask on the basis of what Jesus has done, on the basis of His obedience and the love that He has shown to the Father because He is the one who has uh, earned the right to be heard through His life and through His death. So asking in the name of Jesus, first of all, means to come to Him in, uh, on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. But it also means putting His concerns first. And remember, his concerns are expressed in the Lord's Prayer that his Father be glorified, that his kingdom continue to grow, and that all everywhere would obey him, basically as the angels and the glorified saints do in heaven. And after we have made that the burden of our prayers, then we ask for what it is we need uh, our daily bread, which essentially you know, encompasses everything that we need uh, to, to live, but also to live for His glory so that we can continue His work. 
We saw that, that prayer is asking for the things that the Lord has promised in faith, believing that He will hear us and He will give us these things. Without faith, we can't please Him. Without faith, James tells us, we won't receive anything. We do need to ask according to His will. It has to be consistent with what He has promised. The, the promises, as um, Spurgeon said on one occasion, the promises are like a checkbook and we can cash in on them at any time. Uh, by simply believing what the Lord has told us that He will give us and asking for those things. We need to uh, pray in love with a real desire to see Him glorified. Remember, the faith that is able to receive the promises is a faith that works by love. It's not just a belief that these things are true, but it's a real uh, love for the Lord and a desire to see Him glorified in the answers to these prayers. And we need to, as Jesus points out, rather emphasizes, we need to pray with a forgiving heart, knowing that if we harbor any unforgiveness in our hearts toward anyone, the Lord says that He will not forgive us. And if He doesn't forgive us, He's certainly not going to hear us. Now, again, we, we know what that means is that when we trust in the Lord, He will give us the grace to be able to forgive. Uh, so that really assures us that the Lord has forgiven us and He will hear us when we are able to forgive others their sins against us. Now, that's just a recap of this morning. What we want to consider tonight is what's going to happen when we pray in this way, and more particularly, why the devil wants to try to keep us from praying this kind of prayer. And it's essentially because when we spend time with the Lord, it changes us as we see in this example with Moses. And secondly, when we pray from a life that is transformed by spending time with the Lord and we put His concerns first, it brings about the downfall of Satan's kingdom. Uh, think about what James writes in James chapter 5, verse 16. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. What is it that makes prayer effective? It's when it comes from one whose heart is devoted to the Lord. When we pray with that kind of, from that kind of a heart, with that kind of a life, the Lord hears us and He answers us, and particularly, as I've said, when we put His concerns first. Now, the first thing we want to see is that prayer changes us, the kind of prayer that we're talking about here. Now, we read in our passage that when Moses spent time with the Lord, both on Mount Sinai and then later in the tabernacle, it had an effect on him. His face began to glow with a similar visible glory as the one in whose presence uh, he had stood to the point where he had to put a veil over his face because it frightened those who saw him. I mean, he basically was lit up like a light bulb. It frightened the Jews. Now, Paul tells us that there was really another reason why Moses put that veil over his face, and that was because the glory that was shining from his face was fading. One thing that Paul tells us about this glory was that he says there was glory in the Old Covenant, and this glory was on the face of Moses. The Old Covenant came with glory, the Shekinah glory. The glory, again, was expressed in a variety of ways. But this glory was fading. It was fading because it wasn't meant to be permanent. It was only meant to be temporary. And Paul tells us about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Basically, Paul is telling us here that this glory on Moses' face and the fact that it was fading was really meant to be a picture or a type to teach us that the Old Covenant was only temporary. It was really pointing to the New Covenant and the greater glory of our Lord Jesus Christ that would surpass this glory of the Old Covenant. Now, Paul goes on to say, too, that the veil over Moses' face was also a picture of the blindness, the natural blindness of the Jews, what they were experiencing, at least those who were continuing to hold on 
to the shadows of the old covenant. It refers to the blindness of sin with which we come into the world, but which is taken away when we turn to the Lord. In verses 14 through 16 of 2 Corinthians 3, Paul writes this, But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, once that veil is removed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see essentially His unveiled glory, which we're blind to as long as we're outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we see it, it transforms us into His image in a way similar to what Moses experienced when he was in the tabernacle, speaking with the Lord face to face. And that's what Paul says in verses 17 through 18. He says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Paul here is likening what we experience in the New Covenant to what Moses experienced in the Old Covenant. Moses saw the Lord face to face, at least as much as he could see. Uh, We don't believe he saw the full glory of the Lord because, as the Lord said on one occasion, no one can see my face and live. And yet when he went into the tabernacle, removed the veil, he was said to speak with the Lord mouth to mouth, even as a friend speaks with a friend. He was in the presence of the Lord and seeing what he saw of the glory of the Lord, it changed him and transformed him, and he began to reflect that same kind of glory. Well, Paul tells us here that when we, with our faces now unveiled, behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into that same image from one level of glory to the next. Now, the question is, does that happen automatically? Is it just something that is going to uh, take place in our lives as we go about our lives? Or is there a particular place we have to go in order to see this glory? Well, we know that we have to be where the Lord reveals it. And where He is pleased to reveal it is in worship, as we spend time in the Word, as we worship Him together, as we celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's table. Uh, The Lord is revealing His glory to us, which is why, as I've said before, it's important that we meet together for worship. God doesn't need our worship, but He does call us to worship because it's right and because we need it. We need to see His glory and to be transformed into that same image. But here's, here's the point tonight. He also reveals this glory in a more private setting when we spend time with the Lord in prayer. The more we fellowship with the Lord in prayer, the more we deepen this relationship with our Lord, the more we see His glory, the more the Spirit of God reveals to us who He is and what He's like and His love for us and His mercies. And as that is revealed, it changes us more and more into His image. Now, Jesus tells us in one place in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, that prayer is one of the ways that we can have more of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He says this, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? In prayer, we can ask the Lord for the Spirit, and He will give us more of the the Spirit. And that's what we usually think about in terms of prayer and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is telling us through the Apostle Paul in our text and through this example in the book of Exodus that prayer is also where the Spirit of God works to make us more like Jesus. As Moses spent time with the Lord, essentially in prayer, that's what he was doing. He was praying in the tabernacle. We can spend time with the Lord as well and be transformed by the Spirit's working as we spend time with the Lord into His image. And the point is essentially this, the more time we spend in prayer, 
the more we are going to see His glory by the Holy Spirit. And the more we see His glory, the more we're going to be uh, growing in our love for the Lord. And the more we love Him, the more we're going to become like Him. I mean, what is it that makes Jesus the way He is? And why are we the way we are? Well, the reason why Jesus is the way He is is because His life was essentially that of pure love and devotion to the Father. Now, that's what He calls us to do. But to become like this, we need to spend time in prayer. I mean, Jesus gave His life to prayer. If He needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? Now, if there was ever a secret of spiritual growth spiritual maturity, this is it. Those who were used most powerfully by the Lord were not only tremendously gifted, but they were also those who sought the Lord the most. And you know, it's, it's when we spend time with the Lord in prayer that our gifts are energized and we are able to do what the Lord calls us to do much more efficiently, much more effectively. Uh, you've heard me say this before. It was said of Martin Luther that he regularly prayed two hours a day. But on those days that he had a lot of work to do, much more than usual, he, sp he would spend three hours in prayer, which isn't the way it usually works with us. If we have a lot to do, it crowds out prayer altogether. But he saw the need for prayer when he had more to do. Here's another example that comes from Don Whitney, who is professor of biblical spirituality at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, he writes this about Jonathan Edwards, and this was taken from a quote in an address at a 2003 Desiring God National Conference from a paper that was entitled, Pursuing a Passion for God Through Spiritual Disciplines, Learning from Jonathan Edwards. Uh, listen to what he writes. Edwards was so devoted to prayer that it is hard to find a daily routine for him that wasn't permeated with it. He prayed alone when he arose, then had family prayer before breakfast. Prayer was a part of each meal. And he prayed again with the family in the evening. He prayed over his studies. And he prayed as he walked in the evenings. Prayer was both a discipline and a part of his leisure. Then he goes on to write this. It was inconceivable to, to Edwards that anyone could know the God he knew and not be compelled by the sweetness, love, and satisfaction found in God to pray. Again, remember sweet hour of prayer. It seemed contrary to Edward's understanding of Scripture that anyone could be indwelled by the Spirit who causes God's children to cry out, Abba, Father, and yet not cry out to God in regular private prayer. Edwards testifies that when a person has passion for God, he prays. Now, the question is, do we share that same passion? If we do, then we will pray. And the more that we pray, the more we spend time with Him, the more we will be like Him, the more we're going to want to pray, and so the more the Lord will use us. Now, the fact that prayer basically causes us to shine as lights in the world. Remember how Jesus said, we are the light of the world. What makes that light brighter? Spending time with the Lord. The fact that spending time with the Lord will make us more like Jesus is one of the main reasons why the devil does not want us to pray. It's also why our flesh, the sin in us, doesn't want us to pray because when we grow stronger in the Lord, it grows weaker. Prayer threatens its existence. Paul tells us we should put our sins to death. How do we do that? By spending time in prayer. Our enemies are going to do everything they can to try to keep us from it for that reason. But there is a second reason the devil doesn't want us to pray, and that is because prayer destroys his kingdom, especially when it comes from somebody who is in close fellowship with the Lord as the Lord calls us to be. Again, remember what James writes in James 5.16? The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, what if such a person prays as Jesus calls us to pray? 
that the Father would be reverenced and treated as holy throughout the world, that his kingdom would grow and come with great power, and that all who are on the earth would obey him. What would that mean for Satan? Well, if these things were heard and answered, which the Lord can do with infinite ease, if that is his will, it will bring his kingdom to an end because his kingdom is based on just the opposite principles, isn't it? It's based upon the dishonoring of the Lord, treating his name as unholy, his, his basically enslaving the world and compelling people to disobey the Lord. If the Lord fulfills the petitions that Jesus tells us to pray, it will destroy his kingdom. Now, we do need to remember that God essentially works through prayer. Uh, most of the things that the Lord does, he does in answer to prayer. That's the way that he has made it. The Lord said to Solomon, uh, when Solomon had, had offered all those sacrifices in order to dedicate the temple, the Lord appears to him in a, in a dream at night, and he says in Second Chronicles 7, verses 13 through 14, if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God responds to prayer. We need to ask ourselves the question, why did Jesus, why does he command us to pray? Why did he teach us to pray as he did in the Lord's Prayer? Why do we need to pray at all? It's because we are a part of the process. This is how the Lord has chosen to work things out. He's chosen us to do the work that he wants to do in this world. He's told us that we need to pray for this work. And he has promised that he will answer our prayers as we pray. That's the way it works. That's the way the kingdom of heaven moves forward. And without this, it doesn't because God works through us in this way. Now, Satan doesn't want this work to move forward. So he's either going to keep us from praying altogether or he's going to try to keep us from praying as we should. Now, as long as our prayers are essentially wrapped up in our own needs, our own comforts, our own pleasures, you see, that's not going to threaten him. He's, he's not threatened by that kind of prayer. He, he likes that kind of prayer. And he wants us to keep praying those, that direction. If you were in a health and wealth church like I was years ago for so many years, you'd get a big taste of what that's like, but everybody's wrapped up in their own things, and they're just asking God for things that will make their lives more pleasant. That's not what the Lord really wants us to be seeking after. But if we begin to pray from a heart that is devoted to Him in the way that our Lord calls us to, and if we are going to pray, if we pray for what Jesus tells us to pray for, if we subordinate even our own needs, give us this day our daily bread, to that one great end. Remember Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and then he will provide all these things. And if we pray with the kind of faith and desire for these things, that spending time with the Lord is actually going to bring about in our lives. If we do that, then we will become a very real threat to his kingdom. Uh, Dick shared with me this evening an article that was written uh, regarding John Knox. And I read in that article this quote, the Roman Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots, is reputed to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. Well, the fact is Satan fears our prayers when we come to God's throne with this kind of devotion, and we pray uh, in his power for his glory. Again, remember what uh, William Cooper writes, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Now, can you think of a, of a greater argument to the importance of prayer than that Satan does everything he can to try to keep us from it? We need to pray. Now, again, we, we've seen some examples of prayer from, you know, at least a couple of examples from uh, church history. 
and perhaps we're not going to be able to uh, you know, measure up to that level of prayer to begin with. Maybe we're not going to be able to pray as Luther for two to three hours a day or Edwards at the beginning with prayer woven throughout our lives. Maybe we're only going to be able to make it for 10 or 20 minutes. But the more we pray, the more we're going to want to pray, and the longer we will pray, and the more effective our prayers are going to be, the sweeter, you see, prayer will become uh, for us. George Mueller, he wasn't able to pray at the beginning of his ministry with the kind of faith that he was able to at the end when he prayed that the Lord would change the weather and he knew God had heard him and he knew when he came up out of the hold of the ship the fog would be gone. But he was able to pray that way after a life of prayer, seeing that God is faithful and that he would answer the things that were prayed according to his will. Uh, it's, it's a growing thing, but we need to uh, begin that process or can, you know, continue that process wherever we happen to be in the middle of it. So may the Lord give us grace, the grace we need to be able to grow more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, to grow in faith, to grow into the kind of, of Christians that have this kind of power with God, that we would begin to see things also as, as John Knox also said in that article, one man with God is always in the majority. Uh, if we could see prayer in that light and realize that there is that much efficacy, there is that much power in prayer, um, we would, I think, give ourselves more to it. So may God give us the grace to be able to see it in that way and to know that that is true. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to, to help us do that.